live Skype conference with Atari co-founder Ted Dabney. This is part of the 40th anniversary Atari party that's going on all weekend here. Uh, feel free to sign uh, in the museum when we have a giant card that we're going to be presenting to actual Atari employees, original Atari employees. Uh, at, later on during the summer, they're having a private reunion, uh, about 500 uh, old uh, coin-op and uh, consumer people, etc. So we're going to actually be giving that card directly to them, and I know they're looking forward to getting it. So uh, that's, uh, again, down in the museum wing. You'll, you can't miss it. Atari logo's all over it. People have already been signing it with pens. Um, tomorrow, we'll be talking to Howard Scott Warshaw, uh, as well as part of uh, the anniversary celebration. Howard, uh, if there's anybody not familiar, he did the infamous uh, E.T. game for the 2600, as well as more popular games like uh, Yars Revenge. Uh, but let's get started. We're going to give Ted a call. In fact, I think he's calling on his own. Any video. I don't see you. Yeah, we are. We're not getting any video feed from you. There we go. Uh, Fortunately, it looks like we have a slow Wi Fi. Yeah, I'm getting you here. Yep. Okay, can you hear us okay? Uh, uh, I can see you and uh, hear you fine. As it says, uh, turn off the video for better sound quality. I'm going to Maybe more. Are you still there? Yeah, we're still here. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Okay, good, okay. Okay, let me turn you around. I want you to be able to see the audience in a second. Yeah, I hear you great. Okay, cool. One second. I'm going to turn the camera around so you can see the audience. Oh. Unfortunately, the Wi-Fi in the hotel isn't uh, behaving too well. Apologize for that. Uh, uh, that's all right. We'll do what we can. <laughs> At least it, this year it's not your connection. So uh, let's get started then. So 40 years, uh, the brand, yeah. brand's been around now. Did you think when you co-founded that 40 years ago and went on that strange adventure with Nolan Bushnell that it would still be around all these years later? No. No, it boggles my mind that it's still around. It just, <laughs> I can't, even now it's hard to believe it's still around. Yeah, just just crazy. So why don't yeah. why don't you uh, you know tell us a minute how how that actually besides boggling your mind how proud are you of that that it's still lasting all this time? Oh, I'm I'm out, out, outrageous. Uh, What's really outrageous is, uh, you know, for years and years and years, I was totally forgotten about. And now all of a sudden, you know, the last few years, you guys have acknowledged who I am and what I did. And that, that really means more, more than anything. It means more than what I did is the, the fact that you guys recognize it. 
Well, and we're very happy to do that. And you know, that's one of the great things is that you've finally been able to get this recognition uh, that's been long overdue as far as your involvement in the early years of the brand and you know, and founding it. Uh, you know, most of us wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for you and Nolan. So you know, you guys really you created. <laughs> if, it, if it hadn't been us, if it hadn't been us, it would have been somebody else. It was an idea of time had come. Yeah, true. But you guys did a lot to popularize it too. I mean, you you, you guys are the ones that really brought it to the masses. So yeah, if, yeah. if you can, well, a pong, pong, you just so successful. Oh, pong, yeah. D definitely, right. definitely. Why don't Why don't we start from the very beginning uh, and recant a little bit about uh, how you and Nolan met up and how you started Syzygy? Oh, sure. Uh, anyway, uh, Nolan and I shared an office at Ampex. He had just hired on new graduate out of Utah, and. Uh, he, uh, he had a degree in, edu in engineering, but di he didn't have an education in engineering. So, you know, because he finished last in his class. But uh, he, was, he was a real dynamic guy, and uh, we hit it off real good. But he was a game player. He really liked to play games. And uh, so we played chess a few times. He beat the crap out of me. So uh, then we... Uh, he to, he had started learning to play the game of Go, and I had never heard of it, but he started showing me, and so we started doing it. We were both very bad, but we kept learning, kept learning, got better and better, and we got to where we were pretty even uh, Go players. He was still better than me, but, you know, he's just, he just a much better game player. But, uh, he kept talking. The ideas that he had about a, a pizza parlor with uh, talking barrels and singing bears and all this kind of neat thing. And uh, uh, so we started looking around at things like that uh, to see what we could do. In the meantime, he had, a friend of his over at Stanford uh, Artificial Intelligence Center had showed him this uh, video game that was played on this great huge you know, system computer. And uh, he thought that was really neat, and he, he got me over there, had me take a look at it and say, can we do this? And I, I said, I don't know, we'd actually have a computer of some sort, and I don't know anything about computers. So he says, uh, well, we get there, if we get a computer, we can time share this thing and make, you know, make it happen and have uh, several PlayStations on one computer. I said, well, yeah, that sounds okay to me, you know. So uh, anyway, we didn't know anything about computers, so we got a call of Larry Bryant, who was a computer programmer there at Ampex Video File. And uh, so we sat down in my my house, uh, sitting there trying to hash this thing out and what we were going to do and how we were going to do it. And uh, so Larry Bryant came up with the name Syzygy, was the name he had seen in the in the dic dictionary. So I got my dictionary out, we looked it up, and the alignment of planets and gravitational field, and that sounds pretty good. Okay, we'll call it, we'll call it Syzygy. So we all agreed uh, that uh, we each put in $100 just to get things started, you know, just to have, have a place to start. <laughs> and uh, so that kind of went on, and, and the more we looked at that the more we looked at it, and Larry kept not doing anything. He didn't have access to a computer like he thought he did, and like he thought he did. But uh, the computer was always tied up, and he couldn't get to it to uh, play around with what programming needed to be. So he won't find out never do anything. No, and I couldn't do anything. So, so uh, it kind of fizzled, just died. And uh, so one time, um, so we. No one asked me why when you adjust the horizontal or the vertical hole on a TV set to move back and forth. And so I explained it to him. And he said, could we do that? Could we, could you? I said, well, yeah, but we have to do it digitally because if you do it analog, it'd be nonlinear. 
And he says, well, how do we do that? I said, well, the way this works, you know, I explained again about how the, the sink, for instance, the video uh, was out of count. I said, we could build some counters and, uh, uh, you know, just change the counter, one counter, and have it run from the video and the other one read, run steady. So he, he didn't know that you, he, that you could change the count on it counter but so I said well I'll break board it up and make it work and so I did and he saw it and once he saw that he said that's what we can do you know we obviously asked him if we could do it vertically and horizontally and I said yes we can so we, I built it up and he had the thing and that's kind of where it started and then uh, so Nolan took this great, fantastic idea to Nutting Associates, and, uh, and you know, Nolan's a good salesman. And uh, so he sold it to Nutting with the idea that it would be our game and he would hire Nolan to run, run it and design it. So that's basically how it all came about. And that's, that's what uh, gave uh, birth to uh, computer space. Now you were very yeah. you were very specific in the past uh, that computer space wasn't meant to be a, a clone of space war. It was meant to be just uh, a game that was similar to it or inspired by it. It was inspired by it. Yeah, no, we couldn't we couldn't duplicate that. We didn't have you know we didn't even have any kind of computer. We didn't have a microprocessor. All we had was uh, PTL and, and uh, medium scale integration. That's all we had. So there's no way we could have done that. Uh, we had to draw the little uh, rocket ships and, and uh, 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 flying saws. We had to draw them with diodes. We just actually put diodes on the PC board to, uh, and program those to uh, create the rocket ships. So no, we didn't have vector graphics. We didn't, you know, we just had to straight. So the, uh, you know. So the diodes, the electronic right. components, were actually what was storing the characters of the uh, yeah, ships. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It was in the way you stand the diodes, whether you know what kind of picture you got, you know how you timed it. And if you'll notice on the computer space board, the the diodes are all laid out like a rocket ship, and we had to do that because. Uh, you got to figure out where you are. It's a very difficult, tricky thing to get those things to rotate. You know, very tricky. The the uh, uh, addressing of the diodes is very, very complicated. You know, it was very, yeah. If we had a microcontroller, obviously it would have been really easy, but we didn't. You know, so we had to do it with, with TTL. So what were some of the other challenges? I mean, because th this was the very first video coin-up uh, in existence. So what yeah. were some of the challenges yeah. you had pioneering that? Uh, well, basically, we're just building the thing. I mean, you know, getting it all to all work. That was the hardest part of it. And uh, you know, I had to come up with a, a, a sound circuit that uh, sounded like explosions when the, when the missiles hit the... Uh, uh, flying saucer. So uh, I invented a, an audio circuit that used a Zener diode, uh, a noisy Zener diode. In fact, the, the, diode, the Zener diode were selected for noise. You had a little, built up a little rig, you could put the diode in and see how noisy it was. And, uh, you know, that was, and then I uh, made a, a circuit, a decaying circuit, exponentially decay so that it would explode and, and, and then fall away. And so that was a tricky part of it. Then the next tricky part was uh, getting the whole game to interact with the coin mechanism. You know, if you can imagine that, you've got to, you know, you put a coin in, you got to start the game. Sounds like it's pretty easy, but it's not all that. It's not that easy. It's, you know, it's got to be worked out. The details of it have to be worked out. Well, right, because nobody had done it before at that time as far as interfacing yeah. with the video system. Yeah. Now, had you guys uh, seen or known uh, Bill Pitt's uh, Galaxy game that was going on at Stanford, too? Uh, did you guys go and visit him at all, I heard? Or? No, I, 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 had, I had never heard of the Galaxy game until, you know, years later. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I even 
Okay, so then no I'm, I'm an engineer. I tend to be a bit myopic. You know, I just got to focus in on what I'm doing. I don't pay much attention to what's going on around me, if, if you follow what I mean. Yeah, a lot of technical people, like myself too, we all get that tunnel vision when we're involved in a project like that. Um, so Nolan went ahead, took it to Nottingham, uh, finished it up, and then uh, you went and joined him there after some time. Yeah, uh, yeah as, it, as it started getting more and more like it was going to work, uh, we, we needed to have a cabinet to put this prototype in that Nolan was building. And uh, so we, I started building the cabinet. And, so, uh, in the meantime, I got to go back a little bit, is that uh, when we finally decided to do this and we wanted to actually have a, uh, a, a product that we were doing, the question came up whether uh, Larry Bryan should still be a part of it. And basically, you know, we didn't need him because we didn't need any uh, computer programmers, you know, so uh, I said, well, basically it comes down to the fact he never put his hundred dollars in. I mean, if he had put his hundred dollars in, it, it would have been a, a three-way partnership. But he didn't, and he never did. So he he kind of fell by the wayside. Uh, we, we helped him out later on with some other things, but that's that's a different problem. Uh, now, where was I? What was your question? Well, uh, I mean, that was a good point too, because basically his only contribution then was the naming uh, of the company Syzygy or of the group. Yeah, I, yeah, it was, that was Larry Bryan came up with that name. Okay. So yeah, we were at, uh, you joined Nolan at Nutting then when it looked like things were going to work out with it? Yeah, yeah, we needed a cabinet, so uh, yeah, that's, that's where I was. So. We went out to, I already spent some money on some TV and stuff like that to you know build up the the uh, motion circuitry to you know as a demonstration. Uh, so we we were running out of money a little bit. So we no one and I each put in another hundred and fifty dollars so that I could build a cabinet. And so I went out and bought materials so I could start building the cabinet. And uh, I did that in Nutting's back room in the shop, but. It was taken so much time, I felt, and looking like we were going to have a product, but I figured, well, what the hell? I'd only been with Ampex for 10 years, so I figured, well, we'll just chuck it and start all over again. And I came to work for Netting Associates and uh, was working on the cabinet. That's, that's what I did. We never used the cabinet, but, uh, you know. So who came up with the uh, design for the cabinet that was actually that actually wound up being used? That was Nolan. That was just one of Nolan's airbrained ideas. It just absolutely blew our or blew us away because none of us knew about it. I mean, you know, the nutting didn't know about it. I didn't know about it. All of a sudden, uh, Nolan shows up with his cabinet, and that's the one we. And so then, then the real trick was to try to get everything to fit into that cabinet the way it, you know, it needed to, you know, with a platform for the TV set and especially the coin mechanism, trying to figure that part out and, uh, you know, put, putting the, the door on the back so you could get access to it. That was, that was real tricky. Now, is there any drama but, going, uh, was there any drama going on at Nutting uh, as far as, were they really waiting and relying on this product for anything or? Was it was just just you know we're going to try this out well, and see. Nutty, Nutty, Nutty had been surviving for years on a computer quiz game that uh, they were building and that they had built, and they had a salesman, uh, Dave Ralston, who was a hotshot salesman. He was out there, he was a very old game, old mechanical, game. and uh, he, Dave Ralston busted his butt selling these things to keep the company floating. So yeah, no, they were they were in a hurt for a new game. That's the only way no one could have sold them on it. You know, uh, they really needed something, you know, to get them out of the doldrums. But what had happened as soon as the computer space came along, they started selling computer space, uh, and they were just selling like, like crazy. And, uh, Bill Nutting, not being the smartest guy in the world, decided that uh, 
the salesman was making too much money and he fired him. I mean, that's dumb. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody so, knows you. <laughs> your salesman should be the highest paid guy in your company. I mean, that's what the proof of being a uh, successful company is. So he actually you lost your life. He actually fired the guy for selling too many computer spaces. Yeah, yeah, because he was making too much money. His commission was too much. <laughs> that's crazy. You know, so, Bill, Bill Wilkerson said, Mike, why should I pay him when I can make the phone calls myself? Yeah. That's, that's crazy. So, I mean, because we often hear a lot uh, that, you know, it, that uh, computer space wasn't considered a success, etc. But really, it, it was because it was the very first coin op, well, you know, video coin op. Yeah, it, yeah the thing, it, it, was, it was successful within the scope of what it was intended to do. And in terms of being, you know, uh, a, a real high seller, no, it wasn't a real high seller, but it was expensive too. So, and it was new. So people weren't, you know, they weren't jumping all over it. But, uh, you know, so yeah, technically speaking, as the industry grew, you could sit back and say, computer space wasn't successful. But it was successful enough that Noel and I were making royalties off of it, and enough to, to start our own company after we started Atari was uh, from the royalties we were getting from that game. Now let's let's go on to that. What what prompted that decision to leave Nutting and go off on your own? Well, because no one tried to negotiate with Bill Nutting. Uh, you know, no one considered himself a pretty hot shot guy, which he was. But no one wanted uh, uh, some ownership in, in, in Nutting's business, and Nutting would have nothing to do with that. So we had no, no, no choice. Uh, uh, meantime, no one had contacted you know, some other game manufacturers, primarily Nutting, or uh, Bally. And uh, Bally said, yeah, we can work with you, except the uh, larger with Nutting Associates, we want to be do it. So uh, that's when we decided, well, we'll start our own company. And that's when we started Atari. And like I say, it was all we had were the royalties from that computer space game. So we must have been doing something right. So for the audience that may be confused, what was the difference? Because I know you used the Syzygy name still, even though you had Atari at the same time. What was considered the internal difference between the two? Well, Syzygy was, was the starting point. That was the, the partnership that Noah and I had. <laughs> Excuse me, just getting over cold. Uh, Syzygy was just, you know, uh, when we started it, Atari, we didn't use the name Syzygy very much anymore, or, or uh, except, you know, maybe for street operations or something like that, but we weren't using that name, uh, you know, once we started Atari. We tried to incorporate Syzygy, but, we, but the name was already taken by some lawyer that had it saved for some client, so we couldn't use that. But uh, we we set three names to the Secretary of State uh, from the game of Go, uh, Sente, uh, Hane, and Atari. Those are the three names we sent in, and they picked Atari. We didn't. Uh, okay. But, but, but as far as using, using both names, we, we really didn't use both names. Okay, so then uh, you bring Al Elkhorn in. Now, what I thought was interesting with Al and later on with Summit with uh, the guys that did the uh, Cyan that came after you. Uh, and all that group. I mean, they were all from Ampex. They had all been around you guys at Ampex, and which is really a really interesting fact. Huh? Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. But, well, but, but you gotta, gotta remember, no one was fresh out of college. The only people he knew were his friends from Stanford, and you know, uh, and the people he worked with at, at uh, uh, Ampex. I mean, those were the people he knew. So and he made a lot of real serious mistakes. I mean, he hired one guy as vice, as vice president of engineering uh, out of uh, Ampex Video File, 
And I, I knew that was a mistake, I, and I wound up telling him that, but uh, he, he got a bad, he was, he was a bad actor. He had a master's degree, and no one thought that's really great, and, you know, a master's degree. And I said, no, it's not. No, he said, I said, his master's degree is okay. The problem is he's got a PhD mentality. PhD mentality, nothing against PhDs, but uh, PhD mentality, you know, the kind of people that no matter what decision you make, you can find something wrong with it. So they wind up never making a decision. You know, I met, that's the way this guy was. He, he was. he was really that way. And uh, like I say, nothing against PhDs. I've known a lot of brilliant PhDs that had no problem making decisions. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that brings up a good point. I mean, uh, as Atari was founded, I mean, you guys founded it together. How uh, how did uh -huh. yours and Nolan's relationship start to change, or how did the responsibilities start to change as it started to move along? As soon as real uh, Nolan realized that. He and I were owners of a very successful company. He became crazy. He, be, he became his money, and he had, you know, just his ego just blew out of proportion. And I, I just couldn't get along with that. Uh, what were some of the examples? I know, I know you mentioned to me that he went and hired a PR firm for himself and not the company when it, when it first started. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, that was well, that was early. Yeah, that was early on. That was when I was still uh, working on uh, uh, Valley Project. Uh, yeah, he went on and hired a PR firm, and the PR firm uh, was promoting Nolan Bush. No, it wasn't promoting Atari. No, um, dumb, dumb. I, I don't know. I didn't understand that, but that was, that came actually before the problem realizing that he was having a, a successful company. So you got you guys uh, have the contract with Bally. Now that was for originally for to produce pinball play fields for them. Was that it? And one video game, yeah. uh, 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 a video game and a pinball machine. And no one had come up with this idea of a two-layer pinball machine, and uh, that's what I worked on. Al worked on the, the video game, I worked on the pinball machine. So talk a little bit, please, for the audience. Uh, how did the idea come about then for Pong itself? I'm, I'm sorry, what was the question? Uh, for the audience, what... Uh, how did the idea for Pong and giving Al uh, that project, how did that come about? Oh, yeah, well, uh, uh, no one hired Al, and because, uh, you know, now we have the, the Valley contract, so we had $4,000 a month coming in, and uh, we were still getting some royalties from uh, computer space, so uh, no one hired Al Alcorn, because uh, we knew Al from uh, Amtex Video File also, and he, he always worked, uh, you know, during his uh, college breaks, uh, he worked for Ampex. But uh, this time, we now, now that Al graduated and tried to get back to Ampex, they couldn't hire him. They were uh, having problems of their own. So, uh, no, uh, no one hired him. And, uh, but uh, no, uh, Al didn't know much about what we were doing. He didn't know anything about what we were doing. So anyway, uh, I went over the schematic of the uh, motion trigger circuitry with Al and told him how it worked and all like this. And, uh, so his job was to go design something using that motion circuitry so he didn't know how to use it. Well, the thing he picked was the uh, uh, same thing that Odyssey was, which is a ping pong game, really sim simple game. So he just picked that uh, and and did it, and he did it in just a few weeks. I mean, very quick, very quick. He had this thing where he's sitting there playing it, bang, 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 having a great time. And Noah says, no one didn't want the ping pong game. He just he just didn't want a paddle game at all. He wanted a driving game, and. Uh, so we were having so much fun with this thing. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, uh, I don't even play games, but I love this game. Yeah, it was, we were having so much fun. We just said, no, we got to go with this. This is great. 
Well, then we started talking about what we call it. You know, well, ping pong, the ping pong, pong. ping. Couldn't could you ping? Cause that was golf club. So uh, we we just picked on pong. Now that's an that's an interesting fact. So. Uh, if no one would have had his way, basically this game that has become an icon of the industry uh, would not have been put out at all. No, no, it, yeah, it, it was supposed to, like I said, no, no one wanted a driving game. I mean, he was, he was, I mean, we had, we had an argument. It was just, it was almost knocked down drag out. But uh, uh, between, uh, Al and I on one side, and Noah on the other side. He wanted a driving game, and no, we said, we're going to do this one. This one's a great game. We're going to do this. So Noah said, okay, like, yeah, let's build up a prototype, and we'll find some place to put it, and we wind up with handicaps, put it in handicaps. And, you know, the failure mode was that the coin mechanism got so full of coins that it quit working. <laughs> and uh, so that, that, that said that, that said it all. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean that was the thing. So tell me, tell me about because uh, the audience doesn't know that you originally uh, then had to get out of your contract with Galley so that you could go and market Pong on your own. Oh 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 yeah. Well, we had the prototype, like I said, you know, one of any gaps that was doing so well, and we, you know. Uh, no one, no one did all the uh, interfacing with Valley. I didn't, and uh, uh, but Valley kept not not accepting the game, you know. And we had uh, so what we decided to do is we'd build twelve games. We had enough money we could we could build twelve games, and uh, so uh, I hustled around, got some cabinets, and I got some TV sets and this kind of stuff. And we built up twelve cabinets. <coughs> And uh, we put uh, ten of them out on location, kept one in the shop, and sent one off the ballot. Actually, shipped it off the ballot. And uh, in the meantime, we're getting money from all these games that we put out on location, and just incredible amounts of money. I mean, it was just incredible. And uh, uh, the ballot still kept rejecting or you know, not not accepting the game. So we're sitting there looking at each other one day, hey, and, you know, this is after several weeks of waiting for Valley. And cause we didn't own the game. Valley owned the game. It was their game. And because they had paid $24,000 for it. And now the $24,000 was all paid. And so we weren't getting any money from Valley. And they weren't accepting the game. And uh, we're getting a little desperate about what, what to do. And there's no way that we could have sold it to some other game manufacturer if Valley paid for it. That's not it wasn't even an option. Nobody even considered that. So uh, we figured we had one or two choices. Either we go home and, or we build it ourselves. And uh, Al. Al, you know, we can't, you know, he, Al started going through all the numbers about how much it was going to cost to build any, any you know, a decent quantity of games for ourselves, and the uh, no, number's just no good, and I, I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, let's just decide what we want to do. We, we, I think we agree that we only have one or two choices, either we go home or we build it ourselves. So, let's make that decision, and then we'll figure out what to do. Well, obviously, nobody wanted to go home. So uh, we said, okay, well, I'll, I'll tell you what we did. I'll give up the gap. I'll put it to the TV sets. And you and Nolan get all the PC boards and the ICs. And we'll go from there. And Nolan said, it's going to cost a lot of money. And I said, just do it. You know, just go out and get the PC boards and the ICs. And I'll get the sets and cabinets. And uh, uh, then I said, now, now we got a problem. Oh, no one, no one. I said, hey, yeah, you know, this game still belongs to Valley. I said, okay, well, we got to figure out a way to get them to actually reject the game. So I told Nolan to sit down and write him a letter explaining that they obviously they don't like this pawn game, but uh, if they if they, re they reject it, then we can go ahead and design a different game for them. You know, but in the meantime we can't do anything. So 
no one got the ballot checked. And once we got that letter rejecting it, I told the lawyers to put that in a real safe place. See, the truth is, Bally didn't have the option of reject. So rejected it, the contract was ended. When the contract was ended, they rejected it, so it didn't belong to Bally anymore, it belonged to us. So now, with our game, we didn't know Bally anything, and uh, that, that was the end of the story. So then uh, I got I got the cabinets and TV sets, and uh, it turned out just across the alley from the uh, complex we were in, there was a guy building PC boards, and Nolan sweet talked them into PC boards, and uh, Al Alcorn started working with uh, Kramer Electronics and and GS Marshall, and uh, started getting all the ICs. So we, we were off and running. As far as the cat, the TV sets, I found a distributor in San Francisco and bought 50 TV sets, but I paid for those myself out of my own money, out of my own bank account, because we didn't, you know, couldn't afford that. So I got those, and then uh, I called P.S. Hurlbut, who was the cabinet maker for, for uh, netting, I called him and said, I need 50 of these cabinets. I had given him a drawing of them some months earlier. I said, I need about 50 of these cabinets, but I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to pay you. He says, you can pick them up in two weeks. I said, we don't have a truck. He said, I'll deliver. <laughs> that was that conversation. <laughs> that was incredible. So yeah, I told him right up front that I'd be able to pay him. So then you guys uh, decided to go into manufacturing yourselves, and you rented out an old yeah. ro uh, rolling rink? Is my understanding a rolling well, rink? No, 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 rolling rink came much later. First, we, we just started out with a 1,700 square feet that we had at the coal complex there in Santa Clara. <laughs> and uh, so we started building there, and we were building for 50 games. And we're, just, we're busting our butt building the games. And no one's standing up there in the front of the like that, you know, Tom Turton. And I, said, I went up to him, I said, Nolan, what are you doing? Well, I said, you got to go sell these. Man, he just turned white. He realized, oh, yeah, <laughs> he's got some work to do. I mean, now this is serious, important, you know, down-to-earth work he's got to do. And, uh, so uh, he went back to his office, about an hour and a half later he comes back out he had this dumbest look on his face, I'd never seen anything like it, just really, and I said, well, why'd it go? He said, I made three phone calls and sold 300 games. <laughs> <laughs> this is a game that nobody's ever seen. <laughs> Nobody had a clue of what it was. So uh, he got... Uh, one of the uh, uh, guys, a guy named, um, well, what's his name, uh, Bob Portal, Port Portal Electric in uh, L.A., yeah, he got him to give him a purchase order, which is very unusual. He never used purchase orders in his industry, but he got, he got, the, uh, got him to give him a purchase order. No one wanted to take it to the bank. So we can get some money. We, we knew we needed more money. So we need we figured we need about three thousand dollars. And uh, so I called my banker and and, and uh, um, told him what we needed. And he, you know, so he said, "Well, bring your partner in. We'll, we'll talk." So on the way over there, no one said, "Now you let me do the talking because I can make this really look good and everything." And I said, "No, no, no wait a minute." I said, "The banker has no up." side of that thing. The only thing is you got it the down side. We gotta deal with the downside. He said, nah, nah I got it about that. How we we went okay. Over there and uh, talk to the banker and no one talked us out of getting the loan. <laughs> so he, we, he just uh, he said I decided to not give us a loan because he didn't like no one's attitude for it. And uh, so I went back to T Dale and sat in the house and did yak the yak and I said, This is better you gotta do this, you gotta do that. And so he said, Okay, okay. So then so we got the loan. So we got the three thousand dollars. Well three thousand dollars line of credit, I mean we didn't just give us all the money.
Now that, so, that brings, that good. so that brings up a good point then. So, you know, we're going into 1973 now, and you've got, you know, these things are taking off, and you've got this constant uh, back and forth between you and Nolan. When, you know, when was the decision to, uh, you know, where Nolan yeah. decided yeah. there wasn't a group? There wasn't any back and forth. <laughs> There wasn't any back and forth. I mean, I did my job, and he did his, and and the more he did his, the less important I became. So you know, uh, but there wasn't any back and forth. I mean, I don't know why we were arguing or anything. Uh, um, remember, we got this order for 300 units, and uh, now we had to expand and build more units. So. I, <laughs> I got more cabinets, more TV sets. By this time, we had a, a lot of credit, and uh, uh, but we didn't have any place to put them. So it turned out that the guy in the unit next to ours had gone out, snuck out in the middle of the night. You know, the, his place was empty, and the landlord didn't even know it. So I took a saber saw, cut through the wall, and moved into that space. So now we doubled our, our working space, and. Uh, but that's a lot of the ugly 3,400 square feet. That was still much, much too small. So, <coughs> so we, no one found this uh, uh, roller rink. It was not just on the street, it wasn't very far away. And that was uh, 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 10,000 square feet. We took their people, that moved into there. But we're still getting more and more orders all the time, and uh, the place was just getting jam packed. We, we couldn't, you know, we couldn't even move around in 10,000 square feet. And that's when Noah and I decided we, we need a bigger building, better to find a real, you know, manufacturing building. As the OEP building was uh, available, and we were sitting there looking at it. We we didn't get into the building, but we could look in the windows, and it was 30,000 square feet. So this was a big building. So we figured we'd do this. No one says, well, I'm not sure we can justify moving out this far. I mean, Los Gatos is away, away from uh, Silicon Valley. And uh, I said, no, we don't have to justify anything to anybody. We own the company. And that was the moment that no one realized that he owned a successful company. And that's when his ego started just booming, booming, booming. You know, just, just, it was just not, not a, it was not fun to watch. I don't know if you know what I mean. So then how did it come about the decision that, you know, you guys would no longer be, how did it, the decision that you guys would no longer be working together come about? Oh, that came about because, you know, that, now, now we, we got the Imperial Academy building, we got that building, and uh, so no one started hiring these people to run the company, and he hired this industrial psychologist. Mainly, he hired one of the only credentials that the guy had was that he was rich. He made a lot of money as an industrial psychologist. But no one equates uh, to, uh, wealth with uh, capability, I guess, or something like that. But anyway, Noah hired him as his vice president, or his president. <laughs> he hired Pat Carnes, who was our salesman from Kirk for Electronics. He gave him the title of his president of marketing. He hired this engineer from uh, Ampec, as a vice president of engineering. And uh, <laughs> those are the, you know.